So this talk is going to be about unsupervised learning in deep networks. Um, so why is this important? Um, so why would you, why do you care? Why do we care about unsupervised learning? Uh, so you you seen this slide the other day um, that you know there's a myth that you can't do deep learning unless you have a million labeled examples. And in reality, um, I listed three things that you could do without a million labeled examples. And one of them was um, you can learn useful representations from unlabeled data. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so to kind of motivate why this may even be possible, um, this figure here shows uh, some points that you want to classify. You want to write a classifier in one dimension to classify the, uh, the blue point here from the, the green point. And if all you have is two examples, really the best you can do is, is a maximum margin that sits in the middle um, to kind of maximize the distance between both of these two points. But if, on the other hand, someone gave you this data, instead of the original data, you might think, well, there's a probably a better place to put the classification boundary would be here, because it appears that these here are drawn from a Gaussian, maybe just centered about here, and these, these here are drawn from a Gaussian to centered about here, and you just happen to get something that's off on the tails of the Gaussian here when you, when you uh, drew this example at the start. So your semi-supervised boundary might be here. So the, the, the uh, intuition here is that we've, we've learned something without any labels, simply by looking at the proximity and how things are clustering together. Um, and yeah, that's quite that's a bit different from the supervised boundary. And in 2D, you can make a, a similar argument. And so if you only had these two points, you would, your boundary might be this. But if I showed you these instead, well, you, you'd probably draw something like this. So the idea is that even if we want to do a, a supervised task or something, then write a discriminative classifier or something like that, then having the uh, unlabeled examples should be able to help us. Um, from a probabilistic perspective, what we want to do in, in classification, for example, is to, to find like classifiers, something that gives us the probability that uh, the label is equal to y given the data. And by Bayes' rule, you can say that's the probability of the data given the label times probability of the probability distribution of the label over probability of the data. So we know that we can see here that the, the probability of any particular label depends upon um, is px given y and px. So it depends upon the distribution of the data. The da distribution of the data is in there. So knowledge of these things can, can help us to, to understand these things. Um, and a good model of x, um, probability of x, should have y as an implicit latent variable. So you can imagine if you're a generating process for, for the mnist digits, for example, a good latent variable would be which number is it, right? It would be, you know, first draw which number it comes from, and then you generate a sample from that. So. Uh, it seems like it would be a good implicit latent variable. Um, so um, another example to kind of show um, how unsupervised learning can help in practice um, is, is this one here where we're trying to classify the red points from the blue points. And if we want to do this in, with a completely linear um, classifier, I kind of gave away the punchline there, sorry. <laughs> but uh, if you want to do this in a, in a completely linear classifier, uh, you're, you're going to be out of luck because there's no real line you can draw here it won't give you a, like 50% error, basically. Um, but if we know something about the distribution or, or of the data or the data generation process, then we can do better. So if, for example, we looked at this data and we can hypothesize, OK, these look like they come from clusters. And we fit clusters to these, and we're lucky enough with our clustering algorithm to get the actual cluster centers, then we can represent these points um, as one hot encodings or in, in four dimensions, depending on whether the cluster comes from. So this blue point here will be represented as, as high on 2, for because it's cluster 2. And this uh, red point here will be represented as cluster 4. And um, in this space, in this four-dimensional space, these are now linearly separable. And you can actually uh, you know, classify them with a, with a linear classifier. And uh, if you don't, I, I don't, can't draw four dimensions here to show you this. So if you don't believe me, go to this note, notebook here, and it, it actually will back project the uh, decision boundary. And you can see that it actually works. Um, so okay, so how, how do we how do we model uh, the probability of the data? Um, and okay, so to to do that, you, you can't really do get make much progress at all if you don't make any assumptions. Basically, you have to make some assumptions on your data. Otherwise, there's nothing you can really do. Um, as David McKay said, you can't do inference without making assumptions. And the typical kinds of assumptions that people make are that the data is is smooth in some way. So for example, the points that are close together share a label or share a latent variable or have latent variables that are similar to each other, or cluster assumptions or that the data is, is somehow clustered into these dis discrete groups and that they, in these discrete groups things may share labels. 
or the manifold assumption, which is the one I'm going to talk about more in this lecture, is that the da data lie approximately on a manifold. So uh, of looked l much lower dimension than the input space. So the manifold in this case is sort of, you can think of it as a, for example, a line in a space. Um, so uh, your points are close to this line. Uh, you'll see more about what this means now in a minute. So, so for a couple of examples of algorithms based on these assumptions, semi-supervised algorithms, I suppose, um, is label propagation. So, for example, you may have these two points here that are labeled, and there's some neighbors around it, and you just propagate the labels to the neighbors. And by doing that, you can maybe then train another classifier on top of the, the ones that have all been labeled, and then you, you should get better accuracy. But the problem with this kind of strategy is that in high dimensions, your nearest neighbor is going to be really, really far away, and maybe very, very different to you. So, um, yeah, it, it suffers from the curse of dimensionality, essentially. Uh, the other example is uh, the cluster assumption. So um, this is something you see in things like bag of words models. So um, k-means, um, for example, and using one of these bag of words models, you represent points by the cluster centers, and you, you compute a histogram or something. So this is, this is using the cluster assumption, and it's very successful in, uh, has been very successful in the past in computer vision, where people are, uh, you know, use SIFT and bag of words and things like that. So this is based on a, on a cluster assumption, and you have a, an unsupervised learning step followed by a supervised learning step, and it seems that knowing something about the distribution of the data helps you to, to do classification. And Gaussian mixture models also fall under this sort of paradigm where you, you assume that the data is, you know, clustered essentially into Gaussians, and then you look at first and second order differences. Um, and then you have the manifold assumption. So uh, this is the one that this lecture is going to talk a bit more about. Um, and the most, most well-known example of that is PCA. So this is principal component analysis. And in this case, you model the manifold as a line or a hyperplane in a high-dimensional space. Um, but what's more interesting, I suppose, is the nonlinear manifold. So that's um, where it's not just a line, because a line is kind of restrictive, I suppose, but you can do some sort of curve. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about them now in a minute. So um, yeah, so why do we think this manifold hypothesis might, might be true? Um, well, if you consider things like image data, for example, it's very high dimensional. If you have a, an image that's a thousand by a thousand, and if it's just grayscale, then you have a million dimensions. So that's that's pretty high dimensional data. And we know that any randomly generated image will almost certainly just be garbage. It'll be noise, and it won't look like anything you'd ever take uh, from a camera or anything you'd ever seen in a natural scene. So that means that the space that's occupied by these natural images is almost completely empty, right? So the data must be somewhere. And the hypothesis, with the manifold hypothesis is, OK, well, it, it's, it's near some smooth manifold. Um, and the manifold distance is a good measure of similarity. And you can make a similar argument uh, as this for, for audio and text as well. Um, so this is an example of a linear manifold, like you would get from something like PCA. So in this case, if you want to represent these points by points on the manifold, you just project them down onto the manifold. Um, and on the right, there's a nonlinear manifold. So these are the points, and they seem to lie on some sort of some sort of curved plane here. Um, okay, so there's a, a lemma that says that such a manifold, uh, for a small number of points in a high-dimensional space, such a manifold exists that approximately preserves the distance between points. So, okay, that's interesting. We know that this is true, and this manifold is is at least least it's continuous, so it's smooth. Um, this doesn't really tell us anything about the generalizability of that manifold. So given a, a small set of data points in a high dimensional space and you have this have a manifold for it, does it generalize well to new, new things? But it just tells us that such a manifold can exist. And uh, so that's, that's encouraging, um, I guess. Um, so we want to know a way of uh, fitting sort of these kind of models to data. So you've got lots of data points and you'd like to be able to discover what this manifold looks like. Um, to do this explicitly, like, or to explicitly fit a probability density function, for example, um, is usually intractable because you've got this normalization constant in probability density functions. But if you ignore that and you, you do something like, okay, we just want to assign high energy to things that don't happen very often and low energy to things that do happen quite a lot, or low energy near the data, near our observations, then we, we come with, up with energy-based models. So the idea of them is that you push down on areas near the observations and you somehow we push up everywhere else. And the pushing up everywhere else is usually the hard bit because, I mean, you can easily, you know, put low probability on your, or put high probability or low energy on your, your data points, but how do you push up everywhere else in the space after doing that? Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about that now in a second, but one, one, some examples of these energy-based models are, for example, an encoder-decoder model. 
So if you have something that takes your data points and it encodes them into some other representation, maybe it's a lower dimensional representation, and then it decodes it again and reconstructs it on the other side. And then you measure the distance between the original and the reconstruction. And if you train this on, on your data, right, it should get good at reconstructing the data it's seen, so that's going to get low energy. And things that it's very different to what it's seen should get high energy. So there's an implicit energy-based model there where you've got low energy on the data you've seen and high energy everywhere else. Um, one example of this is k-means, for example. Like, so k-means can be thought of as an encoder or decoder model. You encode things by mapping them to the nearest cluster center. And then you de you, the decoder is just like, OK, well, give us the cluster center back. So the, the, e the error is the distance between the point and the cluster center. Um, so clearly, that means that there's low energy around the cluster centers, and it gets higher as it goes out. Uh, PCA pushes down near a line. Um, and autoencoders allow you to do nonlinear manifolds. So this is what an autoencoder looks like. Uh, you have your data comes in on this side. There's some block here that's called the encoder. This may be a single layer neural network, for example. So one hidden layer, and then you have a matrix multiplication, or it could be multiple layers. And then that produces a hidden representation. And then you have a decoder, um, and that produces a reconstruction. And then you have a loss, which measures the difference between your original input and your reconstruction. And you can backpropagate through this whole thing. So basically trying to minimize this, this reconstruction, changing the weights in the encoder and decoder. And the encoder, the other encoder should get better than at producing good reconstructions of your data. Um, and OK, so you have such a, such a thing, and then you want to use it for some, some actual task, say, for example, classification. Well, one of the things you can do is you can use this hidden representation as your features instead of the original data. So this autoencoder basically represents, produces a representation here, and that representation could be used instead. So you could feed, it, feed that to a classifier, uh, like an SVM or something like that, and then use that to, to do classification. Or you can attach a classification network here and backpropagate through the whole thing. Right? So your, your representation is then, um, your encoder is then also updated to, to be good at classification. Um, so, OK, so as I said before, you need to somehow push up on, on other areas around uh, to put high energy on things you haven't seen. So the standard way of doing that is to just limit the amount of stuff you can have in your representation. So in other words, make the dimension of the hidden representation lower than the dimension of the input data. And then it has to somehow, it, it, it can't assign energy. It can't just learn the identity transform. It has, to, it has to learn something more sophisticated. It has to take into account correlations and things like that. So it's implicitly pushing up everywhere else. The other thing you can do is say, OK, I want my autoencoder to be sparse. So you're saying, I want to limit the number of non-zeros in it. And then you have less, you know, again, it's, it's similar to this idea here. Uh, you have less sort of representational power there. Or you can do something which is quite popular called a denoising autoencoder. So that, and, that, and then you uh, basically add some noise in uh, here. And your encoder then takes this and produces a hidden representation. And your decoder's job is to produce not the, not the noisy data, but the original data. So it needs to be somehow robust to noise. Um, and that robustness um, actually makes it kind of push up in other places. And that, that, that tends to work quite well. Um, so yeah. So that's kind of um, different sort of variations of autoencoders. Um, you can stack these together to create um, uh, stacked autoencoders uh, using greedy layer-wise layer training, <coughs> and then fine-tune these for classification using backpropagation. And this is the kind of thing that um, the people did a few years ago to train really deep neural networks when they weren't able to train, or they didn't have sufficient training data. And it's one of the things that actually caused the, the renewed interest in deep learning in uh, the late 2000s. Um, so how do you do get greedy layer-wise training? Basically, you have an input, and you have a hidden layer. And then you want to have your reconstruction of this input here. And you train that for a while until this becomes good at reconstructing the input. Um, and then you replace that with another hidden layer. And this uh, reconstruction should be of layer 1. So you train it until this, this layer here can reconstruct this one. And then you do something similar again. And then eventually, you have it all trained up to the top, and you replace that by a supervised objective. And uh, you can train then using backpropagation through the whole network to, uh, to update the, the weights. And this kind of allows you to train um, deeper networks on, on less data. Um, OK, so that's kind of all I'm going to say about autoencoders. Um, there's some other really interesting work happening in unsupervised learning at the moment. Um, for example, trying to learn from video um, and trying to learn from ego motion. So one of the interesting methods is called slow feature analysis. And the idea here is that um, 
in a video, things change slowly over time. So whatever features that you've created for, to represent the video frames, they should also change slowly. slowly. They shouldn't be jumping all over the place because uh, what's contained in the video is cha changing slowly. That's assuming you know, we've already done any sh shot boundary detection that we need and we just have segments that are you know, slowly moving. And the other thing is that the second order changes should also be small. So changes in the past should re resemble changes in the future. And this is like, it's, and the, the, if we're going up, we should kind of continue to go up. There shouldn't be kind of wiggling, you know, that way. So the, 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 cha the changes should also be steady. Um, and if you train um, on video with a loss function, a triplet loss function that tries to make things slow and steady um, over triples of adjacent frames and then tries to push apart things that are far away or from different videos, uh, you, can learn, you can learn very good representations um, that work quite well on, on state-of-the-art data sets. Um, and one final one I kind of want to mention is, is ladder networks. This is a recent uh, thing um, that was published that gets really impressive results on things like MNIST with very few examples. So the idea is that you have your data comes in at the bottom and um, if you have a label, uh, your loss will, will be at the, at the top here. So this is, your, this is what you predict and then you have a, a loss for based on you know, how, what your error is there. But you also have some other error terms to sort of regularize the network as you're going along. So the other, the other error terms is you, you basically inject some noise into these layers, and then um, you have a reconstruction here that you try to reconstruct from the reconstruction from the layer above and the noisy version of, of this layer. And so each, it basically it's forcing each of these layers to be very robust to noise. And at test time, you then just transfer your features here and you get rid of all of this noise injection and you just go straight forward through the network. And uh, doing something like that will get you like, uh, like over 98% accuracy on MNIST with only 100 examples, which I think is quite an impressive. Um, so in summary, there's many methods available for learning from unlabeled data. And we have autoencoders, uh, which is what I kind of mainly talked about in this lecture. Um, we have restricted Boltzmann machines, which is something I didn't talk about, but they're quite similar to autoencoders. You need to train them differently. You can't use backpropagation, so you have to use something called contrastive divergence. But they can be stacked in the same way as, as autoencoders to produce deeper networks. Um, a lot of people nowadays, a lot of interest in, in learning from video, and also people have been talking about learning from ego motion. So this is, instead of just learning from passively watching video, you're learning from somehow actively engaging with your environment. So you can imagine controlling a robot around. You know the parameters of where you're making it look, and that can make you learn even faster. Um, and there's uh, some really promising results happening from semi-supervised methods like ladder networks, where you basically have a huge set of data, and then every so often you get a label, and you want to learn both the representation and something discriminative at the same time. Uh, and this is all a very active research area. Um, so. That's everything.